Praise God. We've been in our series on the authority of the believer. We're going to continue on with that today. Last week I talked to you about uh, our authority and understanding our authority that we have in prayer. And prayer probably is one of the primary, uh, primary ways, premier ways that we uh, exercise our authority. You know, it's not by shouts, and it could be. It's not by declarations, it could be. But all those things are important, but sometimes it's just that simple quiet time in the presence of God when you know how to pray and you know what to do, that things change and waters part and difficulties become uh, things that you can overcome. And a lot of it just takes place in the very presence of the Lord. Amen. So uh, today we're going to continue on with the, the, the prayer portion of our Authority of the Believer series, and we're going to talk to you today about pleading your case with God. Amen. I said amen. amen. So this is kind of part two of last week, but it'll take a little different flair. So we'll review just a little uh, so we can move forward into what we want to do. So, and that's the way a series is. You review a little, you go back and you cover ground again, but you go, then you go into new ground. We build line upon line, precept upon precept. We'll keep building on that foundation that's been established. Amen. And I said, amen. amen. You got your Bible. You got your phone. You got your pad or whatever you use. We got all kinds of ways we carry the word with us today, don't we? You put a, you put a whole Christian bookstore in your shirt pocket now. It's amazing. <laughs> It really is. Amen. Now, we, we, we started last week with this quote, um, and I think it's really important. We'll just say it again, not for the purpose of redundancy, but the point, purpose of just getting us where we're going. But uh, this statement was attributed to John Wesley, and some say it doesn't sound like Wesley. I don't know if it was him that where the phrase came from. I don't know if he coined it or not, but the point is, um, regardless of who said it, it's true. It says, it seems God will do nothing for humanity unless someone prays. And of course, the question at that time was, why is that? Well, I think we begin to uh, explore last week and we begin to understand a little bit more of why it is that way. We talked about God's covenant with Abraham and through what Adam did, he gave authority or his authority that God had delegated to him. God had made him in a sense, the God of this world, small g, and had given him dominion over the works of his hands. And Adam gave that away to the devil. And so if God would honor his word related to that authority, then he had to honor the devil or Lucifer or Satan's position. And so God just can't come in. Some people think, well, God just ought to come in and smack the devil out and just let's go on into uh, the millennium and on into heaven. But he can't do that. He's legally bound to do it a certain way. And he can't do it another way. And so it was a man that gave it away. Therefore, it had to be a man that got it back. And so there was this man, Christ Jesus, who was born. Now, Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He drew his humanity from his mother, Mary. He drew his deity from his father, God. And he became the God man. And so it was through him that this covenant that he made with Abraham through that process, Jesus destroyed the work of the devil. Now, however, Satan's lease on this earth has not run out. So only those who are in Christ Jesus have authority over the devil. The world doesn't. But those who know our covenant and those who are not strangers to the covenant, we know that we have authority. That's why we call it the authority of the believer, not the authority of humanity, because all of humanity does not have it, does not enjoy it, are not entitled to it. Only those who come through the shed blood, the saving grace 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Those are the ones who have that authority. And so we won't go back and review all of those things because if you, if you want to look at that in a, in a closer a scrutiny, you can get the message from last week and it'll bring you up through that process. Amen. Amen. And so uh, it is a covenant promise. Our authority is a covenant promise. It is not just an accidental happening, but it's based on covenant that God made with Abraham and fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Now, a covenant requires two people or more. There can be corporate covenants, businesses come into harmony with other businesses, individuals come in harmony with other businesses, and they make agreements or contracts. That's what you would call a covenant. Jesus made, fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant and gave us a better covenant full of better promises. You hear people see things that are written in the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, and they say, well, that's just for the Old Covenant believers. But if, if Jesus did not supersede or do better than what was written before, then his death, burial, resurrection was a miscarriage of justice. He gave us a better covenant full of better promises. So everything you find in the Old Covenant is promised to those who are followers of God, and in our case, through Christ Jesus. We have that plus, not that minus. We have that and more. So if you can find it as a covenant promise, Psalms 91, for example, Deuteronomy 28, all those wonderful blessings that he promised to those in covenant with him, we have all that plus, not less, plus. So Jesus gave us a better covenant full of better promises. And again, a covenant is an agreement. Now, a covenant is a contract that cannot be broken without penalties. If you borrow money from the bank and you refuse to pay, they'll come and repossess something or something of that nature. There's consequence to breaking covenant. And if we are in covenant with God, there's consequences to breaking that. Now, what's the consequence? Well, the covering that God's given you, the protection that he's given you, because it says that we come under a covering when we come to him. You can find that in the book of Isaiah. But that covering, um, the curse is there. You know, here the last few days, we've been having a lot of rain. Okay. Well, you know, I have to go out back and walk the dog. You know what I'm saying? Well, we have an umbrella on the back porch and we go get the umbrella and we go out and walk the dog. Well, the umbrella keeps us from getting wet. All you got to do to get wet is put the umbrella down. You don't have to wonder if you'll get wet. It will happen. Why? Because the rain is there. That's like the curse. The curse is on the earth because of sin and because of what Adam did. And all you have to do to get wet is put down the blessing. You fold up the umbrella, you'll get wet. So it's not God cursing anybody. It's just the simply the curse exists. It's not God doing it. Many people say, well, God did this and God did that. You don't, he didn't have to do it. Circumstances will do it it's, you know, on its own. And our decisions will do it on their own. Amen. So the curse is there, but the blessing gives us a way to stay dry in the wet. He gives us a blessing that will protect us from the curse. Amen. Amen. And that blessing is this covenant that we share with the Lord Jesus. Now, again, God made that covenant with Abraham, and it's a powerful, powerful, powerful truth. And then he passed that on, and through Christ Jesus, it came upon us. It says that the blessing of Abraham has come on us through Jesus Christ. Now, remember, we're talking about our authority in prayer. So we're taking you somewhere with these things we're talking about. Amen? Again, Galatians 3.29, if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to 
to the promise. Now remember God called Abraham his covenant friend. We saw that in James. We saw it in other places. And then Jesus said some things. He said, I don't call you just simply regular people. He said, I call you my friends. And that's a covenant term. It's not just a normal term. It's not just, you know, you're friendly with, you can have a lot of friends. You can go down here to the supermarket and you make some kind of acquaintance and you're friendly and therefore you'd call that person to a degree. It might be a shallow friendship, but you'd call it a friendship. But Jesus is not talking about that. He's talking about a covenant friendship that he made with us through what he did on Calvary. In the same way that he called Abraham his covenant friend, he calls you, child of God, his covenant friend. And Abraham, there's a, there's a story that we all know about Sodom and Gomorrah and, and the things that happened because of their wickedness and on and on and on. And God determined that he was going to have to deal with the iniquity that was going on there. And some would say, well, you know, why would God destroy? Well, I had uh, somebody, it was, it was recent, it was a child really, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a legitimate question. It, well, I don't think it's fair for God to send people to hell. Well, if you think about it that way, it might seem unfair that God would just send somebody to hell. Well, let me ask you, in your neighborhood, if you had a person living next door to you that you knew they were a murder, murderer, they were a rapist, they were a bank robber, they, they had done all kinds of bad things all over. Do you think it would be wrong for somebody to take them out of your neighborhood? Well, God has to rid the human race of the outlaws before you can enjoy the freedom and the peace and the joy and the relationships that God intends for you, he has to remove those things that hurt and harm and destroy. It's not God's will that any perish, but it's necessary to give you the future that he wants you to have. So he doesn't judge because of hatred for them. He loves them. But he loves you in such a way that he wants to give you the future that he intends to give you. So it's not a bad God doing something bad. It's a good God doing something good. Amen. Amen. And that's really important. Really important. Amen. And so prayer is a covenant agreement and it should be deliberate. It should be on purpose. It should be believed and it should be offered in faith. And so when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I can't do this unless I talk it over with my covenant friend, Abraham. Now, remember something about this. Now, in Hebrews chapter 7, and uh, there's, there's surrounding scripture, but one of the, the key phrases in that, and it's talking about covenant, it's talking about agreement. It says, the less is blessed of the better. Now, the reason that we make covenant with one another or um, a bank or a lending institution or a, a person that's going to give service to you. Maybe they're going to do something at your house. Maybe they're going to do some work for you, whatever. The reason that we make covenant or make an agreement with them is because they offer something to us that we don't have. Now, the less being blessed to the better, there are people who have more in one area than another person does, but they may have less in another area than another person does. So there's a reason that people make covenant. I need what you have, but you also need what I have. If you don't do it that way, there's really no point in the agreement. You can just go along without it. Okay, why would God make covenant with us? In a sense, God, because of what happened through Adam and the transgression and Satan's takeover by usurping Adam's authority, 
God is on the outside of his own creation looking in. He, to, to come in and just tear everything up and start over, he has to break his predetermined covenant or his predetermined word, and God will not break his word because if he broke his word, he would be a liar, and Satan is the father of lies. And so God would submit to Satan, and he won't do that. So he won't break his word, period. And so since God won't break his word, he needs an entry into the earth. And his entry into the earth are those who are born of women. You find in John chapter 10, can can we put John 10 verse 1 up here? Um, I I didn't tell him I was going to do that, so... We'll give you a minute. But in John chapter 10, we, we know John 10, 10, that's the passage where it says, the thief cometh not before to steal, kill, and destroy. And we're familiar with that. But in John chapter 10, verse number one, he said, verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now you go down in that. Now we know Satan is the thief and the robber. But now if you analyze that scripture just a little bit, it says the the sheepfold. Now, everybody say, I'm a sheep. sheep. Now, you understand what I mean. You're not literally a sheep, but symbolically you are a sheep. We have a shepherd and we are the sheep. My sheep hear my voice. That's in reference to you, okay? That's not an offense. That's just a truism. Amen? Okay, the sheep have to enter into the sheepfold by the door. That means the people who live on planet Earth, the sheepfold, that's the populace, the population of the planet, all right? So to get into the Earth, the legal way into the Earth is the womb of a woman. That's how the sheep get here. And if you get here any other way, you're a thief and a robber. So Jesus had to come through that door just like you did. Amen. Amen. And so God, to get his will in the earth, he has to do it through the legal mechanisms. The legal mechanisms are those who are legally here, not thieves and robbers, but you're entitled to be here because you came through natural birth. All right. You follow, you follow that. Yes. You know, So, point is, when the scripture says in Hebrews 7, the less is blessed of the better. Now, remember, I'm saying all these things respectfully, but I'm trying to draw some contrast, so just for our understanding, for illustration purposes. In a sense, now see, God has all of the resources. All of them. God's the God of everything. He has no lack. He he, he doesn't have a need in the normal sense of what you might, he's not hungry. He's sure not broke. He's got peace, you know, all those things. But in a sense, God in this covenant relationship is the less in the covenant. He can't do in the earth what he desires to do without your help. He, he's got all the resources. The one thing he doesn't have is entry. We are the body of Christ and members in particular. We become his entry point into the earth. And so we didn't have anything. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, you give me yourself and I'll give you everything I got. How shall he not freely give us all things? That's exactly what he said. I give you everything I got. All I want from you is you. We didn't bring anything to the table but a bushel basket full of sin and stupidity (laughs) and everything that humans are without God. That's all we brought. But you know what? That's all he wanted. He said, you give me entry We'll change that. 
I'll give you my mind. I'll give you my wisdom. I'll give you my resources. I'll give you, I'll give you myself. But we just have to say yes. So in a sense, see, we, we didn't bring anything to this covenant table, but our boatload of sin. And he brought everything that heaven has and all the resources of heaven. But in a sense, in that one, one area, he needs us as much as we need him. That's amazing. That's what he needed covenant for, to get an entrance into the earth. And so he made a covenant with Abraham, which was fulfilled in Christ Jesus, of which now you are a part. And so it's being fulfilled now in us. And so we are God's entry point into the earth. Amen? Amen. Now, so when God said, I can't do the things that are necessary in Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sin, that cry comes up against me. And he said, I can't do anything unless I talk to my covenant friend, Abraham, about it. Think about that. God won't do it, can't do it, unless I talk it over with the one I'm in covenant with. See, there are things that you may think God ought to do this. Well, why doesn't God get involved in our political system? I can't do it unless I talk it over with my covenant folk. Invitation. Well, God can do anything he wants to. If you believe that, then you'd believe some other lie. He cannot do everything he wants to do. There's a whole lot of things God wants to do that he can't do. It's not God's will that any perish, but all come to repentance. He doesn't save everybody. Even though he desires to, even though he wants to, he doesn't do it because he has to have invitation. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. You don't receive him, you don't get it. It's on us as much as it's on him. You follow me? He has a will, he has a desire, he has a plan, he has a purpose, but we have to be a part of it. And so we're talking about the authority of the believer and especially our authority in prayer. And today we're talking specifically about come, let us plead together. Very important. Very, very important. Much of the authority that you exercise, you'll exercise in prayer, not by shouting on the housetop, but by bowing in your prayer closet. Amen. Amen. So he said, I, I, won't, I won't destroy that city or those cities unless I talk it over with my covenant friend. And Abraham nego negotiated with him. Now you look up the word negotiate it is a perfect fit for what happened. It's an exchange between two people who come to terms about a certain thing. It's a negotiation. It's what it really is. Okay, it's not a bad word. And so Abraham negotiated with God. He said, would you destroy it for 50? He said, no. He said, how about 40, 50, 30? You know, took it on down. And he got it all the way down to 10. He said, I won't destroy it for 10. And so Abraham negotiated the terms of the judgment of God. That was a man who negotiated the terms of the judgment. I'm talking about the authority of the believer. You understand this? This is no small deal, guys. This is a big deal. You know? Well, I didn't know that. Well, you're knowing it today. Well, I don't believe that happens to me. Abraham's blessing can come on us through Christ Jesus. You're not here in the earth just to breathe good air and, and eat a lot of food and water and drink water. You're here for a purpose. Yeah. And it's to manifest God's will in the earth. Amen. He tells us in Isaiah 1 and 18. Let me read it. He said, come now, let us reason together. Saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. On and on and on. But notice God said, come, let us reason together. Now, together is a, is a, a word that requires more than one. You can't be together by yourself. So he said, come let us reason 
together. Let's talk it over. You tell me what you want. Let me tell you what I want. Let's talk this over. See, God wants to have that kind of relationship. See, we think prayer is just going to God and we're pulling out our list and telling him all the things we want. Well, give me, you know, I want a new bicycle. I want to, you know, here we go. But see, God is needing you to manifest his will in the earth, not just for you to get stuff. Now, he'll give you stuff. Jesus said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, that's as much stuff as you can think up. So he'll give you the stuff. He said, I know what things you have need of before you ask. He said, he said why do you consider the lilies? They toil not, neither they just spend. Do, do, you, do you not know that not a, a, a sparrow can fall from there that I, that I don't know about? He said, all these things. He said, how much more are you? You think I won't give you all these things? I'll give you anything you want. Just walk with me. He's not withholding. He's not, he's not withholding. See, so much of our prayer is one dimensional. Us going to God and not giving him the opportunity to speak to us so his will can be manifested in the earth. He's got a plan too. Now, how do you get his will in the earth? Well, that's where you get into declaration and, and various things. You remember we talked about Jeremiah. He went out into a, to a, a wilderness area and preached sermons so he can control the airways. Well, I don't think we can do that. Well, then you don't know the scripture. That's why I'm here. Amen. And so um, this word reason it, in, the, in the Greek, the word means to argue like an attorney. Now, I'm not talking about arguing with God. I'm talking about, you know, when you uh, go to court. I don't know if you've been to court, but you've watched enough law and orders or whatever. <laughs> you know what they do in court. They, they argue a case. Well, my, my client's innocent because, no, they're guilty because. See, there's that arguing the case. There's the setting forth of reasons why guilt or innocence. You know, well, it's that kind of term. Jesus said we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That's a legal term that represents an attorney. You get Jesus on your case, you win you don't have him on your case, you're in trouble. When we stand before God and give an account for our life, you get Jesus on your case, you win. You don't, you don't. <laughs> Amen? That's true. See, and that's a legal case. So he said here, the term reason is to argue like an attorney, attorney or prove your case or plead your cause or justify your position. So when you talk to God, that's what he wants you to do. He said, come let us reason together. Plead your case. Talk to me about it. Tell me why I ought to do that for you. Tell me why I ought not do that for you. Let's talk it over. See, that's what we don't do in prayer. We just go with our list. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And God said, well, I'm not against you having this, 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 and this. He said, but remember, I have a will that needs to be done in the earth. Help me out a little bit. You see, in covenant relationship, it does not just end with the one. Come let us reason together. So in a sense, I'm obligated to ask him what he wants done in the earth. I'm talking about the authority of the believer. Amen. Amen. So praying with authority has an element of negotiation in it. Now, I'll, I'll illustrate this. Let me, let me read to you from Isaiah 43. 
And we're going to turn over here to Acts 9. Now, again, I know this is not on the scripture list, but I just thought about it before I came up here. And so I put myself a little marker in my book. Amen. But you remember, let's, well, before I do that, let's do this. Isaiah 43, 25, even I, I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, not for your sake, his sake. Now he did do it for your sake, but he said, I have a need here too. So I blot out your transgression. This is God speaking for my sake. So I have a vested interest as well as you do. Hmm, pretty important, huh? And I will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Now, this word plead, again, it's a legal term. Like if you go to court and you plead guilty or innocent. It's that type of term. It's a plea. It goes back to that legal uh, covenant binding relationship. So in covenant with God... We have some say-so on what happens. Well, I don't think we had any say-so. It's all God. I mean, man has nothing to do with anything. Man has everything to do with it. Whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. See, this is God and sons. We're in harmony here. We're not at odds. But we need to know what not only our authority is, but we need to know with that authority what responsibility is associated with it because authority has responsibilities attached to it. You know, you may be the mom and dad. You may have authority in the home, but with that authority comes the responsibility to train those kids up in the way they should go. Amen? So with authority comes responsibility. All right. So here he said, let us plead together. And he, he said, declare thou that thou mayest be justified. So as we plead, we make declarations or decrees. See, remember, the declarations that we make and the decrees that we make have everything to do with what the, you remember we talked about in this, the angels hearken unto the voice of the word of God. So when you put God's word in your mouth, that's what they do. We got idle angels, I-D-L-E, not I-D-O-L. We have angels that are idle because they have no orders from the church. Well, I'm waiting on God to give orders. He said, I'm waiting on you to do it. I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to tell you what to do. And then it's going to happen because you say it and do it. Because it is harmony between us and him. Jesus said, I only do the things I see the Father do. I only say the things I hear the Father say. So the instruction came from heaven and the declaration took place on the earth. You may have to think about this a little while, but I promise you it'll change your life when you think about it. <laughs> We're asking God to do what he's already done. You already have it by covenant. We just don't walk in it. God, would you heal me? Yes, 2,000 years ago. I'm just saying. Okay, but you see over here in Acts chapter 9, and you remember the story when Paul was, he had that experience on the Damascus road. He saw Jesus, it, it, it threw him off of his horse, and Paul was way out of the will of God. And, and, and in, this, in this vision, he said, it's Saul, Saul, it was before he was Paul. He said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks or the goads. He said, there's something prodding you and you keep running up against it. You're coming up against that cattle prod that just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and you're out of the will of God and you're going the wrong way. And I keep trying to goad you back into my will, but you won't listen to me. And it came to a crisis moment. 
And Jesus appeared to him. Well, Paul had orders to kill Christians and orders to just do all sorts of bad things. And of course, he brought terror. I mean, everywhere he'd go. He had written letters that, that gave him that kind of authority. And here after that happened, and he said yes to the Lord. Well, everybody, you know, they didn't know that private experience. I mean, this guy still got a bad reputation. And then we find here in, in Acts 10, and there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And he said, and, and the, to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I'm here. And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the street called straight. And he said, I'm, I'm going to send you down there. And uh, I want you to lay hands on Paul or Saul. And, uh, you know, I, he's got a work he's got to do for me. And he, he can't see because of the vision. So I want you to go down there and when you lay hands on him, he'll get his, he'll get his sight back. He'll get filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, on and on and on. And Ann and I said, uh, verse 13, Lord, I've heard of, <laughs> by many of this man how much evil he hath done uh, to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, go. Now see, that was a negotiation. State your case, let the Lord state his. You understand? Now, he's the ultimate authority, but you still got to say so. I had a lot of situations like that when God was calling me into the ministry. I don't want to. And he'd be patient for a little while, and then the goads would come. I still don't want to. And it took three years of that. Before I finally said, okay. And, uh, you know, I still, of course, I had some talks with him about, I, I said, this looks like the quickest way to the poorhouse to me. He took me to Mark 10, 29, 30. He said, now listen to this. He said, now there's no man that has, to, has forsaken houses, brethren, sister, mother, father, and all those things lands and etc. except he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. No man forsook these things for the gospel's sake. He said, he said, I'll take care of you. State your case. He stated his. You do this, I'll provide. You do this, I'll provide. Okay. I said, well, we can do it that way. And he has. You know, later he asked his disciples after they'd been out all over the countryside preaching that gospel that he gave them. He said, when you went, did you like anything? They said, nothing. I'll have to say the same thing. When you obeyed me, did you like anything? Not a thing. He has been there every time, all the time, more than enough, every time. It costs me nothing but obedience. But financially, now there was a setback at the moment, but I'm telling you over the long haul, it cost me nothing to obey him. The costly part would be to disobey him. I can tell you that. But see, you negotiate. You talk it over. He didn't get mad at that. He said, come, let us plead. Let's talk it over. I want you to come and talk to me about this. I'm not really going to get upset. We see, and we're so afraid that we're going to get out of the will of God or do something. And here, here Ananias, he stated his case before the Lord. In a little bit, you could say he had a little argument against this. But God settled him down. He said, no, you go. He said, this is a chosen vessel for me, and I'll take care of you. You need to go. You need to do it. And there's times that he has to talk to us that way. So, you're, you know, this whole covenant thing is a relationship. See, God needed Ananias. But Ananias, if he went, he needed God. Believe me, this could be deadly. Do you understand? And so he said, let us plead together. Now, remember, in this negotiation, we're not talking about arrogance. We're not talking about going in the throne room and, and to throwing a temper tantrum. Or turning the furniture over. You go in there humbly. 
submitted to the God of the heavens and earth and all that therein is, understanding who we are and who he is, but understanding also he needs you. That kind of changes it a little bit, doesn't it? Hmm. Okay, Lord. I'll give you me. That's all you want is me. And he said, okay, I'll give you everything I have. That is exactly what he said in covenant relationship with his disciples, soon to be apostles in the upper room. Whatsoever you ask the Father in Jesus' name, I'll, he'll give it to you, whatever you want. Oh, it doesn't mean that. Well, why did he say that? Whatever you can believe, you can get it. If you have faith for it, you can get it. Faith is the currency heaven recognizes, and it'll get it for you. And so, in, but now, he said whatsoever he asked the Father in Jesus' name. Now, we, we made that distinction a little bit earlier in our teaching, a few sermons back. But there's another passage that's similar to that you find in John 14 that's, that's very critical. In John 14, verse 13, And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. Okay, so Jesus is talking about asking him. Now, in one place, he said, in, in chapter 15, he said, Whatsoever you ask the Father. John 16 also, he said, Whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Now, that's, that's prayer. Prayer is directed to the Father in Jesus' name. So this is not prayer. This is something else. He said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So he's talking about a relationship that's directed toward him, not to the Father, but toward him. And that word ask there means to demand or to make a demand on. That's what it means. Now, if you look that word up in the Greek, it's an interesting word. And uh, it, it has to do with desire or something you require or need. But it also um, carries with it a deeper meaning, and it means to place a demand on something that is due. Now, we talked about this somewhere in the process of this uh, disclosure, but if you go to the wall over here and you flip on or off the light switch, you, you, you make the lights work because you make a demand on the electricity that's in the grid and it comes into the room and it lights the lights. It's that kind of word. You push your foot on the gas pedal and your car responds because you make a demand on all the systems to make that car go down the road a little bit faster. You make a demand. You write a check on an account you have you take it to the bank and you cash it because you make a demand on what's there. It's that kind of word. It's not you go in and say, well, I'm telling you right now, God, this is what you're going to have to do for me. It's not that kind of demand. <laughs> it's something that he's... If you go to the bank to cash a check, you're not going to get anything if you don't have anything on deposit. See, you're making a demand. Now you need a miracle. <laughs> Okay, now you, now you need a miracle. But if you make a demand on something that's yours, he said, I'll give it to you. So he said, whatsoever you ask the Father in Jesus' name. Now see, that's a demand, but it's a dem demand made in prayer to the Father. But what he's talking about is the declaration, Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. When you make a faith declaration, Jesus watches over the word you speak, he said he watches over his word to perform it. He, watch, he, he is the guarantee of the new covenant. What you say, Jesus watches over to bring to pass. That's the demand we're talking about here. So God has things he wants done in the earth, but he's got to have somebody to make a demand on it to get his will done in the earth. A demand, or we demand again, from Jesus as, as being the recipient from him, but we make the demand to Jesus. We request of him. Amen? 
And it's done respectfully, worshipfully. But it is done, listen, legally. I heard of a revivalist that was preaching the gospel in, in some, you know, big uh, cities and things. And he was a great man of prayer. And uh, he, he said, I find myself having experiences in prayer of late that are extremely uh, wonderful and amazing. Now, that's a little of my paraphrase. But he said to God, he said, God, you got to know who you are. He said, Father, you don't think we're not going to have a revival here, do you? See, he knew who he was. Now, I guarantee you, he was inspired in prayer to pray that. See, he was making a demand on the one who could do something about his condition. It's like Caleb, God. Now, I'm putting my words in Caleb's mouth, but I think it was something along this line. God, you don't think after I put up with this nonsense for 40 years in the wilderness with this unbelief, you don't think I'm not going to have my mountain, do you? So you understand covenant, you can talk like that. You don't understand covenant, you'll be waiting on God. Well, God, why don't you do it? Well, God, I don't guess you ever will do it for me. I don't guess you want to. Just put a clamp on it and stand your covenant ground and don't take no for an answer. God, you don't think you're not going to bless me, do you? takes courage, but it takes wisdom and understanding of your covenant. You can talk like that if you've got that kind of relationship. If you don't have that kind of relationship, wait till you get it. <laughs> don't go in, as they say, half-baked. Amen. So, again, it's done respectfully, but it is done legally, and it's, it's done... Um, in that legal sense, according to your covenant, that's where the demands come from. So we make a demand on the goodness of God, according to the provision of God or his will. Now to be scripture, you got to have scripture to be covenant related. You got to have words from the covenant, which is the Bible. Now there's a, there's a thing that, um, Well, let me read it to you out of Matthew 6, verse number 9. Now, this is Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. Amen. Are you all tracking with me? I'm talking about the authority of the believer. And I'm talking about your authority in prayer. All right. But in Matthew 9, or verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 9, after this manner, therefore, pray you. So Jesus is telling us how to pray. He said, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven. So we're going to the Father. Hallowed be thy name. So we come with worship. Right attitude. And then he said, thy kingdom come. Well, that's what Jesus did. Now, the kingdom is the king's dominion. The dominion of the king. What God wants to do. Putting this stuff under his authority. Amen. Amen. But he needs you to do it. Well, you know, uh, God is running the earth. Well, he's got it in a mess. <laughs> he's not running it either. If he's running, he's running it in the ground. There's an outlaw loose on this planet. And you were put here to enforce the will of God. You're on an outpost. This is Fort Apache. <laughs> There's a story behind that, but I won't get into it, Alan, wherever you are. <laughs> Amen. So after this man of pray, he said, thy kingdom come. So we're praying God's kingdom. Now the kingdom did come when Jesus went to Calvary and then was raised and all that. So the kingdom manifested, but there's still manifestations of the kingdom that are still unfolding now, even as we're here. Amen. We're putting things under the king's dominion. Amen. Amen. He said, thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. So God has a will that he wants done in the earth. But notice how it gets here. Pray ye therefore. 
Well, it'll just happen. No, it won't either. <laughs> now, remember the quote from Wesley? It seems that God will do nothing in the earth for humanity without the prayers of his people. It tells you right there. So you've got to pray God's will into the earth. Well, I believe that God wants to just move in Knoxville. Well, I'm going to tell you, he may want to, but he's not going to unless you have something to do with it. There's a whole lot of things that God wants to do that he can't do because he doesn't have the cooperation of his people. So we pray that God's will is done in the earth as it is in heaven. Well, I don't know what his will is. Okay. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Infirmity means weakness. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That's what you just said. Well, God's will done in the earth, but I don't know what it is. Okay, that's what he said. You don't know what to pray. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Why do you think God filled you with the Holy Spirit? Why do you think God gave you a heavenly language? So you could pray the divine secrets of Almighty God into this earth. The mysteries of Almighty God. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 12 and 14. I mean, it tells you point blank. Now you get a lot of benefit out of it by praying in the Holy Spirit. You edify or build up yourself. But it's more than that. You're praying God's will, his divine secrets, his divine mysteries, the things that he wants to do in this earth that you don't have a clue how to do it, what to do, how to even go about it. What we, be, we begin to unfold his plan in the earth in our prayer closet. Instead of just asking for stuff. We bring his pleasure, his will, his direction, his blessing, his favor, his provision, his healing, his anointing, his delivering power. We bring it into the earth by praying in the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, that's just for you Pentecostals. No, it's for everybody that knows and understands. Yes. Yes. You have such a privilege in prayer that you don't even know. You become one with Him in prayer. You become one with Him in your presentation to God, in your prayer closet. You bring His presence into the earth. You usher it in. Like the revivalist said, God, you don't think we're not going to have revival here. See, it was God's will anyway. That was God inspiring a man to be that bold in prayer because that was God releasing something into that situation that he wanted to. And if that man wasn't praying, it wouldn't happen. There's a lot of things God wants to do in your own personal life. And we're still begging and you got to get the clutter out of the way. You got to get the obstacles out. How do you get the obstacles? I'm telling you. Some of the things you got to get out of the way through prayer. How do I know? Look at the next verse. And he searcheth the hearts. He's looking at the heart of the matter. He said, listen, he helpeth our infirmities, our weaknesses. These areas where you can't produce what you need to produce. These areas that seem to be so elusive. You can't seem to get this thing. I've, I've, I've talked to God a million times about this very issue. He, he said, that thing, that stubborn thing that you can't get straight, that you can't get figured out. I know how to help that weakness. I know how to help it. He said, I will search the heart of everybody involved. Your own too, if you've got bad motives. But he said, I'll search my heart too, and I'll show it to you. In your prayer closet, when you call out to me, and you begin to pray it with your heavenly language into this earth, 
when you don't know what to pray for as you are, the Holy Spirit takes hold together with you with groanings which cannot be uttered. And you begin to manifest His will in the earth. And you begin to bring what He wants done into the earth. And you begin to take your, your position and it gets exalted. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. Give me my mountain. We can't seem to break the ice. We can't seem to break through. I'm telling you. How you do it? Right here. Right here. Well, I'm too busy. We'll keep failing. Spend all your life and all your activity doing nonsense. Going to the movies, going to the show, going out to eat. I'm not against any of that. But I'm telling you, when it takes precedence over your relationship with God and your prayer closet, you're too blooming busy. Well, I don't have time to do that. You got time to fail. Well, I can't even seem to get this business off the ground. I'm telling you. He knows your weakness. He knows what it takes to fly the plane. He knows the forces that are at work against you. And he knows to get them out of the way. He knows how to move them. He prays those, you pray those divine secrets. You begin to pray yourself through to another level. He searches the hearts. Listen, knowing what is the mind of the Spirit. And he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. See, when we pray in the Spirit, we bring his will into the earth. And then what happens? Verse 28, and he works all things together for good. We just claim that verse without doing the previous verses. Well, everything, you know, in case of Ross or Ross, I had a car wreck, but he works all things together for my good. Wake up and smell the coffee. That's not what that means. He said, you get in prayer, you pray the will of God into the earth, and then he'll work all things together for your good. There's a lot of things not working for your good if the enemy has his way about it. But the point is, is we can put his trip off. We can, we can stop what he does through that prayer closet. We have authority in prayer that we have to exercise, that we have to bring to bear. We have to put pressure on it. Well, God will do it anyway. Que sera, sera, what will be, will be. It's not going to happen. We're in a cooperation. I can't do it unless I talk it over with my covenant friend, John. James. There. I can't do it without them allowing me. Will you let me do my will in the earth? The authority of the believer. A lot more than we thought. And so Jesus told us to pray God's will in the earth. It's not automatically going to happen. We have to make it happen by extracting the will of God out of that spirit realm and putting it in this earth in our prayer closet. You don't like what you got? Change it. You don't like the direction of your life? Change it. Well, I can't change it. You have to change it. God's waiting on you to cooperate so he can help you. Mother Teresa said this. He said, God speaks in the silence of the heart. Listening is the beginning of prayer. Finding the will of God and praying it into the earth. Amen. So prayer is a special place. It's a holy place. Now I'm going to read to you. This is a scripture that you have to qualify it to understand it a little bit. Now we know that every believer has access to the Father in Jesus' name. You know that. You do know that, right? So this is not exclusive. This is whosoever will may pray, may pray. <laughs> Amen. But there are places that God takes some that are different. You've heard me say this before. When you enter into that prayer closet and you begin to press that issue with God and you begin to go in there and you begin to get comfortable in his presence, there are rooms in prayer that he wants to show you 
There are places in prayer that are sacred between you and him that he does not give others opportunity to know about or understand. Believe me. Believe me. In Jeremiah 30, verse 21, and, um, well, let's just read it. And their nobles shall be the be of themselves and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them. Now I want you to listen to this next phrase. And I will cause him to draw near. In other words, there's this invitation that God issues. And he said that as you have a hunger for me, I'm going to cause you to draw into a deeper level. He said, I will cause him to draw near and he shall approach me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord. Now, let me read it to you out of the Amplified Classic. He said, I will cause him to draw near and he will approach me. For who is here who would have the boldness and would dare on his own initiative to approach me, says the Lord. That's the, that's the revivalist that said, Lord, you don't think we're not going to have revival here. Now, see, if you're a casual prayer, you wouldn't say that. Why? You'd be afraid to. But see, this man that spent so much time in the presence of God that they're comfortable with one another. See, they can talk, they can negotiate. You can't negotiate without invitation. I hope you understand that. You can pray because you choose to pray. But at this level right here, some of these rooms we're talking about in prayer that God wants to show you, invitation only. You want it? You've got to spend the time to get it. It's not to the player or the one who's got it as a toy. It's a person who wants the will of God into the earth and is unwilling to come out without it happening. Now let me tell you something about prayer of this nature. There's two very important things to remember. You go to God with your requests, but many of those requests will be inspired by Him to begin with. That's what praying in the Spirit is. He's even showing you what to pray. But let me tell you, child of God, this is a very important thing right here. Unless we begin to listen in prayer, you will have a lot of the direction in your life unknown to you. You have to extract not just the will of God into the earth for situations and circumstances. You have to extract the will of God for your marching orders. You do things without praying about it, you're going to have a hard life in front of you. You begin to pray out the plan. You begin to pray out. And you got to give him time. Now, there's some things I could say here that I won't. But I do understand this world. I understand this world. And there's just things God's going to say to you that if you do it, it'll make you wealthy. It'll solve a lot of your problems, a lot of your woes. Because remember, he's searching the hearts of the matter. He's dealing with this, 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 and this, and you. And he's showing you his heart in it. And you begin to extract all that and you begin to mix that up inside you and you begin to homogenize into the plan of God in the earth. You become it. He's all the while working in you, the will and desire to work and do of his good pleasure. He's putting his will in you and bringing it out. He makes you think a certain way, act a certain way, talk a certain way, walk a certain way. Chance meetings are not chance meetings at all. Chance phone calls are not chance phone calls at all. And it's all extracted in that prayer closet. It's where it all comes from. And we don't have authority because we don't know the authority giver. We don't know his nature. We hear sermons about him. We hear songs about him. But he didn't want you just to hear sermons and sing songs. He wants you to know him. 
He wants you to know Him better than you know any other human on this planet. And when you discover Him, amazingly, you will discover you. Because He knows you better than you know you. And all the heartaches and all the woes that come out of doing it our way on our own will leave you. Ann and I didn't want to go, but when the negotiations ended, he did the will of God. And that's what God wants for you. So God not only will let you bring your request, he will also tell you how to live your life. He'll give you the orders for life. Now, does this make more sense with that discovery? When you read from Psalms 91, and we claim it all the time, we claim all Psalms' blessings. The angels, you know, they watch over us, they bear us up in their hand. No sickness will come near my dwelling. You know, we, we claim all those things, and we should. But the preceding part of that disclosure in Psalms 91, 1, he that dwelleth in the secret place. You know anything about the secret place? Well, that's what I do back and forth on the way to work, on the way to school. I got in my, you know, preaching sermons and I, you know, and I listen to the Bible. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about going a little bit beyond that. I'm talking about you in a relationship with God. that's holier and stronger and more powerful than anything you've ever known. If you don't want that, you can go to heaven, but you're going to miss a lot of heaven here. You're going to miss a lot of what God has for you. He said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress, my God, in Him I trust. Nobody can shake you. Nobody can move you. Nobody can deter you. Nobody can stop you. Because you have that absolute knowing in yourself of who you are and who He is in you. I am closer to God than I am any other person. And I, nor I are close. But I know God better than I know her. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there that know God. You know, and I'm not trying to compare notes. Thankful for whatever. But I'm a, well, it sounds like a boast, but it's the truth. I feel a little self-conscious saying it, but I, but I promise you it's the truth. I know God better than anybody I know. Now, I didn't say I know God better than anybody. I just know God better than anybody I know. And I know I know Him. It's not wondering, do I know Him? I promise you, I know Him. It's not verses about him. I know him. You want to know him that way? Do you really? See, God told me when I preached this, he said, if there are people who want that, he said, if you'll release it to, it, I'll, to, them, to them, I'll impart it to them today. But you got to want it. Do you want it? Do you really want it? Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot. If you, and if you don't mean it, don't do it. But if you want it, stand up. Now, Nora, she's a great woman of prayer. And I know her. So I know what I'm telling you is true. Now, really, if I, I assume that you really do want this, we're going to impart this to you. See, that's how a lot of things happen. They happen by impartation.
Now, if you're watching online and you want this, if you really want it, God's going to impart it to you today. See, he watches over his word to perform it. So he brings these things to our attention, not to tantalize us or trick us or drag us along or put a carrot in front of us. He says it to us because he wants us to have it. Of course, we know we need God. But he needs you. And he wants you. And he wants to show himself big in you in ways that you've never even imagined. Praise God. You want to say anything before we impart this? Are you ready? I want you to just lift your hands to heaven because that's where the blessing comes from. Father, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, right, oh my. Lord, we command that blessing right now on this house, but not on the house only, but every individual right now that's reaching out in, in, in their heart and longing to have this relationship. Right now, we impart it in the name of Jesus. We bind every force of darkness that would try to hinder that or take that away or not allow that to come. We take authority over you. Every blinding force, everything in the name of Jesus that was try to stop or steal. Distractions, discouragements, unforgivenesses, broken relationships that try to intrude. Right now in Jesus' name, we search the hearts of the matter and we drive them out. And we command the blessing of God we command the favor of God. We command that anointing, that invitation into that holy secret place. And Lord, we will yield to that. We won't do this perfectly, Lord. Just as you've told me in my prayer closet, when I would go and I said, Lord, I don't, I don't know if I'm doing it right. And I've heard you so often say to me, there's nobody here but me and you, son. It's okay. You don't have to do it perfectly. Let's just do it together. You're calling us to that place, Lord. I know you are. You said my house shall be called a house of prayer. Lord, you're calling us by your hand, by your anointing to be that house of prayer. But to be a house of prayer, we have to be a people of prayer. Oh God. Just impart it right now. Just impart it. Just do it. We call on you. We trust you. We believe you. Show us what it's like. Elijah knew it. Enoch knew it. They walked with you. Moses knew it. Paul knew it. Peter knew it. We want to know it. We don't want to just know about you. We want to know you. We want to know you. Lord, let it happen. Invitation only. You've put out the invitation, and now your family is responding. Thank you, Lord, for the response of, this, of the Spirit right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. For as you call out to me, saith the Lord, deep calleth unto deep, and as you call out to me and you put yourself in a position to receive these things that have been offered to you today, I do not offer these things everywhere. I offer these things here to this body, to this people, to you individually today. Because it's a special day. It's a special day of calling forth and a special day of calling out and a special day of blessing. Not for everyone, but those who want it, those who desire it. And this call has been issued to you because I deemed you worthy to receive it. I deemed you as a body who would receive it and embrace it. But not just a body, individually, every person in this room and every person listening online, 
you're there by divine appointment and the invitation is directly to you today. So as you reach out and lay hold of it, saith the Lord, I promise you that it will be imparted to you in ways that will astound and surprise you with my goodness and my favor and my blessing. And it's in my name I give it, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Say what you got on your heart. I just hear the Spirit of the Lord down in my heart say that you heard about rooms today. And God wants you to prepare for Him that place, that meeting place that room where you can get with him and he with you. There are things that he wants to reveal to you before they even happen. There are things that he wants to bring to your attention ahead to keep things at bay. And you can meet him there. You can meet him. We can meet him there. So precious. So precious, prepare, prepare that place, prepare that room for him. I heard, uh, heard these words. I heard, I heard from more than one person, but you said, Lord, I've gotten so far off track that I don't even know how to get back. Well, God's getting you back today. Yes. So you're not too far off track. He's pulling you back on track today. Amen. Now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed and to respect the moment, if you would, I want to ask that all important question. That question is more important than anything. Are you sure that you're right with God? Are you sure you're ready to meet the Lord? Should Jesus come today or should you draw your last breath? If you don't know, you can know and you can know before you leave. If you're watching online, you can know. You can have Jesus as your greatest companion, as your greatest friend as that friend who sticks closer than a brother. If that's you in the house and you want prayer, would you lift your hand up right now and say, that's me, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. Anyone before we go further, just identifying yourself. If you're watching online, you don't have to raise your hand because I couldn't see it, but you can raise that hand in your heart to the Lord right there where you're at. Let's all pray this prayer together. Say, Jesus, I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. You are not my God. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. Let's all just lift our hands and thank him that he hears us when we pray. Lord, we thank you. You never turn your ear away. I want everybody in the room and if you're online and you're if there's somebody in the room with you, uh, you can do it. But if not, you can let us know. But I want everybody to turn to at least three people, look them boldly right in the eye and tell them that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Would you do that?